Welcome everyone to a conversation about the future of digital health in America. We have uh, three subject matter experts that are going to share their words of wisdom with us. We're going to ask, uh, my job is going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to ask just two questions and we're going to spend a fair amount of time uh, digesting those questions and unpacking them. And then we're going to save at least 15 minutes mm -hmm. to take questions from the audience. And I think it's uh, virtually poetic that we're in a room of this configuration to talk about digital health. I feel like I'm on the, any Trekkies in the room? This is like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise right here. Remember tricorders and flip phones and diagnostic machines and bones med bay. And so just to set a tone for digital health, which we all uh, miraculously watched in the 80s. Um, so uh, I'd like uh, the three of you to provide a brief intro on yourselves, just like one or two minutes and a little bit of your background. You can do a much better job of that than I could. Mind Absolutely. Uh, my name is Michael Amp. I am a local physician, more certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. My photo is here first in the list, first in your heart. Um, I am a Grand Rapidian Catholic Central graduate, and yes, I hold degrees in public health as well. Uh, I have a couple of jobs. One of them is I'm president of Answer Health. For those of you who are familiar with that, that is the largest independent physician organization in West Michigan. We are about 1,200 physicians. And uh, here, sort of representing the independent body, we'll talk a little bit about the future of digital health and digital medicine. Roger? I don't know if the Catholic Central thing was so great, but the rest was pretty impressive. For, the, <laughs> for those public school graduates <laughs> in Grand Rapids, we have. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I think you'll I'll appreciate again. the pair of you. That's right. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try to use a couple of syllable words at least. So, yeah. Uh, so. I'm Roger Jansen and uh, Chief Digital Health Officer for Michigan State. Amongst other things, uh, I'm involved with private equity groups uh, in healthcare and with a number of companies around the country, including some very large family foundations who are working on transforming healthcare. Joe, Joe Brennan, uh, founder of Moonshot Health Consulting, and I'm also the director of provider solutions for Title Care, which is an Israeli technology company that provides devices for telehealth. I'm also the co-chair of Digital Transformation SIG for the American Telemedicine Association. And I am Catholic Central grad at 97. Oh, man. Oh, damn. Oh, God. Yeah. God. Yeah. God. Yeah. God. Yeah. God. All right. Wow. Thanks for that, Barry. So, so I mentioned there's just going to be two questions, but they're big questions. They're fundamental core questions, and they're designed to be provocative and informative and engaging with the audience. So, uh, question number one, and we just want to talk about this for a couple of minutes to set the stage. Are Americans healthy and happy today, in your opinions? We're here to talk about digital health and how it's going to change and it's going to improve and so forth. Well, where are we now? It, it reminds me of the mosquito that shows up in a nudist colony. Where do I start? <laughs> so. <laughs> Are we healthier? Well, we just had, there was just an article that came out of Medscape this week that showed that for the first time, our average life expectancy dropped 2.2 years to 76.6. So, here's some data that tells us we're kind of worse off than ever. 40% of Americans over the age of 40 are pre-diabetic or diabetic, close to 100 million. 40% of Americans over 40. Wow, that's same data. That is six times higher than any other country in the world. We lead the world also in hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary disease, procedures for coronary disease like caps, stenting, peripheral vascular disease, COPD, obesity, sleep apnea, joint replacement. So are we happy and healthy? No, we're kind of hanging on. You know, so I think our obesity, which is an undertone that attaches all those comorbidities, is probably cheaper responsible in an epidemic that we have really have to go after in the future. What you're saying is we're number one. So we're, we, are, we, are, we are number one. Or we're leading many lists we should. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I think it's, I mean, everybody in this room has their opinion on what that question could mean. But to me, it goes back, if you're asking about, and I think you are, specifically healthcare, um, we don't pay for people to be happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, we pay for people to be sick and injured. Incentive. Yeah, I mean, you know, nobody's getting paid to make sure everyone's feeling great and taking care of themselves. Um, you know, when I was uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Spectrum, I challenged our board of directors. I said, 
who would you guys call if you wanted to get healthier at Spectrum? And nobody knew where to answer because nobody does that, um, right? We have a lot of people who fix you when things are broken, but we don't have anybody to kind of take it from. <laughs> Let's imagine somebody with diabetes. If you have diabetes and you are pre-diabetic and you move into diabetic, that's a 900% increase in your cost to your employer if they're self-insured and to yourself if you're independently insured, right? That's a huge deal in this country and we're not stopping the progression of that anywhere. When you look at uh, countries like Singapore, Japan, Norway, and others, their rates on all these diseases are actually on the decline. And I would make the argument that um, it's not necessarily just the food and the hospitals and the healthcare. It is the infrastructure that we put in place to put things in our body that were never meant to be inside of our bodies, right? So one of the things Michigan State has is a great nutrition science program. And I had a discussion with our head of nutrition science. He happens to be from France. And he said, one of the things that we've learned is the stuff you guys still allow in your food, we cut out in the 60s in our country. We don't even allow those ingredients to enter into the processing of food. So, you know, I look at that and it's difficult to answer the chicken and the egg of what's causing the one causing the other. I got a positive spin on that. I think that what we've seen in evolution of like wearable devices and technology, apps that track things, I think if we look at how all of those pieces are being integrated, there is there are some positive signs that, that people are more engaged in their health more than they have been in a very long time, simply because they have it in that thing that they look at all day. So I think positive signs when, you, when people are more conscious of how sleep affects their health or what they put in their body. I think the technology that we just have grown so accustomed to is helping us steer in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So we're, do you think, I don't want to put words in the mouth, would you characterize it as we're in the early stages of learning what the, uh, how that can affect outcomes? Absolutely. Yeah. Very early yeah. stages. Uh, I think a definition might be helpful of what digital medicine and digital health actually means. So from my perspective, it is any software-based, evidence-based tool or product that improves the delivery and practice of medicine. And because that is broad, we need to have a more rigorous definition because there are many health apps that people find very helpful, but they're not evidence-based ones. And so we have to have an evidence-based one to be able to get regulators and payers to help build a business infrastructure to stand on to measure outcomes so that it has legs long-term. Otherwise, there's not sustainability of a business model, right? And you know, as a physician, for us to adopt new digital medicine applications, you know, we're going to ask four principal questions. And one is, does it work? Is it efficient? Is it smooth? Two, am I liable? Yeah, what is my risk? Three, do is there a payment structure, and is it connected to health payers? And four, will it uniquely work for the type of medicine that I do? Right. So it's very new, and because it's very new, my concern would be progress in silos, right? right? So if there's an ever an opportunity to have a whole group of stakeholders together to share, you know, cross-directionally to improve this, it's now. So to Michael's point, uh, a few years ago, uh, New England Journal of Medicine ran a study on health apps. There are over 300,000 health apps available to the consuming public. Take a guess how many of those had any clinical, not out of 300,000, 5,000 they sampled. How many of those had any clinical uh, research tied to them? Anybody want to take a guess? Throw it, just come on. Single person. Five. Five. Pretty damn close. Yeah. Four. <laughs> Four out of 5,000 had any clinical uh, research tied to them. And, you know, part of it, actually, what Gordon's working on. Uh, through his company, Twist Health, and we've got exposed within Michigan State is, uh, how do you do more research trials on health data and health apps and things of that nature with true, you know, blind researchers, study outcomes, all the nine yards that we need to look at uh, to make good assessments. So, and I also think what, what you were sharing is huge, that I think you're right, people are starting to have the tools to engage more, yet we're having all these outcomes that you had mentioned. So, 
crazy balance. I, I think that the timing is right because I think you have a willing population to engage into a new form of technology. Um, timing is everything. Uh, you know, years ago, we tried to do a collaborative uh, project with our ECS folks, 210 emergency medicine physicians and staff, the 14 hospitals of Spectrum Health, and it didn't go well because nobody wanted a telemedicine visit. This was about five years ago. Now, if we had just waited for the pandemic, we might have been okay. Um, and I think that now has, the pandemic has created an opportunity that there are a number of visits that we can do over a telemedicine platform that have high value, but again, it's regulators at the table, it's payers at the table, because this is a new clinical care model. So there's no patient face-to-face -face visit. So how do we price and how do we reimburse structures? What do those look like? And that's critical because for payers to say, we want to be engaged in this and develop this with you, we have to make it a business model, again, that has some substance and some structure so that people will say, this makes sense, this has value, this is good information, and it's integrated into the electronic record. Any more commentary on uh, the question of are, are Americans uh, healthy and happy today before we shift here? So I think I'm happy. <laughs> I, I don't think we have a very happy society. I mean, that's my personal, I, I'm happy to support that. I, I got it yeah. for you. Yeah. And they produced an article, we have an 800% increase in mental health claims data in the last two years. And that means claims data. Those are people who sat in front of a health professional a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a counselor. So that does not exclude the people who are, that did not seek care yeah. but need to. Yeah. And we have, a, unfortunately, a real dramatic shortage of people who render primary care and mental health care. So that's, uh, no, we're not happy. Lee, do you have any data on that? Not off the top of my head, but I do know there are three and four month wait times for, for clinicians in this immediate Grand Rapids area for any kind of mental health issue. Mm -hmm. So and, and I work with Dr. App and do some referrals and you want testing kinds of things, you're talking, you know, you might as well put yourself out a year before you're gonna have any testing for ADD or dementia or anything like that. So it's I I get a, I know how desperate things are because I got a call from one of my own clinical uh, partners and I haven't practiced in years to come in and see patients and do neuropsych evals. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, you don't want that happening. That'd just be bad for everybody. Uh, but it really talks about the desperation to see people. I mean, they're just so backlogged. It's crazy. And the states were willing to do emergency licensure and all that as well. And cross state license. Cross state license, yeah. You know, so I think that, you know, that's really a deep question. We have both physical and mental health. And uh, we have a lot of opportunity to improve on both. You mentioned a moment ago that our life expectancy went down two or two and a half years. That's right. Is that exclusive to America or is that a global phenomenon? That is an article specific. Other countries have definitely experienced an increase mm -hmm. in life expectancy. So that's in the United States, first time ever in U.S. history. Yeah, and let's not forget, we're paying twice what any other advanced nation is for our health care. So, uh, you know, think about that for a moment. That we're paying about double what everybody else does but we're ranking dead last out of the other 13 OECD nations that we compare ourselves against on clinical outcomes measures. Dead last. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we got really smart docs, we got great facilities, what the hell's going on? Yeah, 20% of our GDP, now one in every $5 is spent on yeah. healthcare in the United States. Four trillion. You have a statistic you mentioned recently about what it's projected to be not, not too far off, right? Yeah, so CMS put the projections out of these last week or the week prior that they're expecting to increase the fastest ever increase in U.S. history to 6.8 trillion by 2029. Um, that's absolutely unsustainable for the country, and something's going to have to change because, um, you know, as much as we love all this infrastructure, um, I don't like going into my lawyer's office when they have beautiful facilities and buildings and say, well, you need this to be productive. Actually, you don't. Uh, and I think sometimes we get caught up in the sale of what things are versus the outcomes of what those things should achieve. And that's scary, uh, really, really scary when I think about it. Also, when you look at the payment we're making to healthcare executives, it's out of control. Uh, you know, yesterday- Can I say amen? Yeah, amen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah, yeah I'm that's guilty of being one of those in the past. So, uh, but you know, when I when I look at this, um, you know, the CEO, I'm going to get the group wrong. It's either Cigna, Aetna, or United. One of those three took home 28 point million. I'm sorry, 42.9 million dollars last year. Okay, for an insurance company. The CEO of, I won't name the insurance company here in the state of Michigan that calls itself a not-for-profit, took home $22 million as the CEO of a not-for-profit insurance company in this state. There's criminality, in my opinion. Forget ethics, that's criminal in my so mind. some people are happy. Some people are happy. Well, you know what I'm going to tell you? The Northview really wasn't that bad in my high school. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> CEOs have increased, healthcare CEOs have increased their salary 700% in the last two years, and physicians have gone down. Now, I think what's important, and I don't want to, this is about digital medicine, but I think we also have to acknowledge the group of people who take care of the people. So there was an article written by the American Medical Association two weeks ago called The Great Resignation, and it highlighted that one in five physicians, mostly primary care, plan to leave medicine in two years. And these are not traditionally retired people. These are people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. I'm 55, for, for the record. And that's, if it takes eight years from college graduation to train a doctor, there's an absence of six years of physicians. We have a shortage today, as we sit here, of about 50 to 125,000 physicians nationwide. And that's pre-article. Of the 80% who intend to continue to work, Dr. Greenberg and myself, one in three says, I'm going to go down in my hours and I'm going to go down in my days of practice. So how do we change the population who takes care of the people who's growing old? And do we need doctors? We need them desperately, more than ever. What we have, too, from a population standpoint, this is where my public health comes out. In 2011, our baby boomers began to turn 65 right, 1946 to 1964. And Medicare tripled in the first five years, from 2011 to 2016. So when you talk about the dollar spend, we have an aging population, and we have aging physicians taking care of an aging population. The fastest growing cap per capita age population in the United States is 85 and up. They're not the baby boomers, they're the silent generation. So we have a cost of care that, that might be an underestimated that Roger st stated, but it will be high no matter what it is because we have a population of aging people and we have not prepared on how to take care of them. Good seeing everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've established a foundation of uh, where we believe uh, American health is and American happiness associated with their health is. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. So now, Hopefully some good news and some uh, projection and some... <laughs> and how, how can digital health help Americans become healthier and happier tomorrow? Well, so I don't have the, the same... Well, it's not doom and gloom. You guys are just talking reality. No, unfortunately, it's reality. It, it is reality. Yeah. But uh, the organizations that I work with, like specifically direct primary care or virtual primary care, organizations that are completely at risk. They build the model themselves. Um, I've worked with groups like Nice Healthcare out of Minneapolis, uh, Carbon Health out of San Francisco. These are people who started at zero and said, let's figure out how we can build this. We'll charge you a membership and we'll figure out how to take care of you as a person. And because they're completely at risk, your wellness is more important than your sickness. So the, the ivory towers and the beautiful facilities and the $2 million bonuses, that doesn't exist in a direct primary care model or a virtual primary care model that someone has built from scratch. Mm -hmm. So more and more, as I traverse telehealth, there are organizations that are popping up to say, we're gonna do this cheaper and we're gonna do it better. Mm -hmm. When you talk about how fat and unhappy we are, when you're at risk for somebody to remain healthy, you incentivize that, because right now there is no incentive. So if you look at a group like Frontier down in Austin, Texas, they're gonna incentivize you to make sure that you do those wellness initiatives that they put up front. So rather than focus on uh, how can we take care of your cold, cough, and COVID, they talk primarily about how do we make sure you're eating vegetables and you're eating clean and you're getting sleep and you're getting exercise. Mm -hmm. Obviously wellness has been around for decades, but usually when you put it into an employer, the person who wins the free Fitbit is the person that's already running marathons. It never makes sense. People don't, it, it's not effective. 
But when you take direct primary care organizations, that's where you start to see change. So I share the reality that they do, but I'm a little more optimistic in thinking that we've been saying disrupt technology for a really long time. But I think COVID forced a lot of people to reevaluate what this could look like. And as Roger knows, there is a tremendous amount of money right now being invested in actually disrupting the change. So thanks. Just, you know, one, I think Joe's right. The, the, everyone's familiar with direct primary care models, uh, Allison himself for brevity. Uh, there's a company here in West Michigan. It's a publicly traded company. I won't name them out of, I'm not sure they want public or not. But they have reduced their healthcare spend uh, over the last 12 years every single year. Uh, that's unheard of to go down in their pop employee population is going up. And the reason they've done that is they have unevenly distributed that care. Uh, they're self-insured and what they did is they identified their most at-risk populations and they gave them a ton of care. Uh, exercise coaches, mental health, food, all these other things. They surrounded them with the resources they need to become healthier and better employees. And as a result, uh, their loyalty shot up, their productivity shot up, their retention shot up, and their cost shot down. And so this is very doable to your point, Joe, but it takes a very different mindset. Now, who's not encouraging that, unfortunately, is a lot of the systems that we have that are in place to not let that happen, uh, where they get paid when somebody gets sick, injured, or is ill. And we have to recognize in this country, fee for service is pretty evil from a actual care perspective. It doesn't incentivize the right behaviors in many cases. I think there's great promise in digital medicine. I see three big things. One, I think it can improve access, provided we have good models, right, that are evidence-based, that show that they truly work. Um, Do you think there's going to be an FDA for digital health? I, there'll have to be. So I think there already is. I mean, there was, the recent, there was a creation of probably three years ago with the DIME Society, which is an acronym for digital medicine. And it's an intersection between, you know, global health strategies and all of the stakeholders that are involved with digital medicine. And this could be the first time that we have such a broad group of people who are interested in dropping total cost of care. And I think we say digital medicine, it's easiest for us to do the drop down and say, okay, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, but then I say software engineers, hardware engineers, payers, regulators, web designers. I mean, I think everybody wants to see healthcare delivered in a, in a better way, a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. And then the center of all that where it needs to be integrated is with the patient is how do we make it uh, user-friendly for them and engaged. But what I can tell anybody, Dr. Ringer agree with me, my email tells me that people are engaging a lot more than they used to. Uh, when we made email available through Epic, the first thing I said to myself is there will be a day I get more emails than patients I see in a day, and I'm approaching that now. And we can't do that to the physicians because we're just, we're just gonna tax them. So I think digital medicine has great promise, done properly, the right people at the table, to make a significant difference, particularly in the most costly comorbidities, which is congestive heart failure, COPD, and diabetes. Yeah, Gordon, I think that digital medicine can't just digitize what we already do, right? I think it needs to go above and beyond that. And so if you look at things like remote patient monitoring, uh, which I think is at the one yard line of a very long field that it still needs to go down, but I think it's the right direction um, if you take a look at things that are, um, you know, good and or bad with the limited access we have, chatbots or AI that could potentially be used, do these things replace people? 100% no, right. right? Are there certain cases where they may be effective just as I get on to order my travel tickets and I get a pop-up that's, I know it's a chatbot, but it's still helping me get through some of that? I think probably. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, what I don't want to see is everybody trying to take what we currently do and just saying, now let's make electronic. Right. I think that's not going to be that groundbreaking. It has to be more interactive. And I, I think the term digital medicine evolved to really differentiate the dogmatic, conservative, face-to-face -face medicine that we have to this new evolving strategy. So we are seeing signs of it. I, examples, I think, you know, we have remote patient mantra, which is a start, and I would agree there's a lot of potential there. 
But you know, you also have digital monitoring for cardiac patients, particularly ones who are discharged from the hospital. Do they have events to reduce 30 day readmission? Uh, they're working on a sensor for people who have total knee replacements where the idea is flexion at home. And would it be great for the orthopedic surgeon to see that, say, now we've got 30 degrees of flexion, they're improving. So there's a lot of tools that are being designed that are going to be specialty specific that can make, you know, practice of care and fill in information between visits that could be dramatic. Um, but those are down the road. I think we've started bigger. Well, than it, than just yeah. to, the, the highest paid people at the organization I work for are the machine learning engineers. These are the, replace the CEO salary with those engineers. There's only a handful of them in the world that understand machine learning better than anybody else. And what we're doing at Taito with wheeze detection, because you're giving a stethoscope to an end user, and you're having them do an exam for themselves mm -hmm. so that a physician can hear it on the other end. Yeah. But if you don't want to have the physician there while it's happening, right. you can run it through artificial intelligence that will do a detection to say, the probability of this is 97%. Okay. We highly recommend you do this. So we're not recreating what is happening face to face just with digital tools. I think they're taking it a step further. It's sort of it's like a digital triage. Yeah. So one of the things that I would really add is that we have to remember most people don't get healthy or ill in the doctor's office. Okay. So most of our lives are lived outside of seeing a clinician. And I don't think about my doctor when I think about living a healthy lifestyle. So I think one of the things we need to look at digital health to do is actually get to the social determinants of health. That social support, where we live, where we eat, where, who we hang out with, what we're doing. The stuff that frankly, we don't ever talk about that actually has a bigger play in determining somebody's health outcomes than the stuff I've done in the office. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff just tells me, it looks like you've lived a really interesting life. Here's all the shit that that created for you. Um, what we need to do is we need to get upstream and say, what are the things that are actually determining those outcomes? Mm -hmm. Why is it what Daryl pointed out earlier that if you live in Wyoming, you have a 20 year less life expectancy than if you live in East Grand Rapids? Why is that? Um, if we look at Philadelphia, we know that if you live in inner city Philly, anybody from Philly, any chance? Any chance? If you live in inner city Philly, right now you have a 19.7 uh, shortened lifespan compared to people who are living just six miles away from you, okay? That's unacceptable. They're not different humans. They're not different outcomes. And they're not saying necessarily even different doctors. They're not utilizing other things in their life that determine their health. So one of the things I think we have to do with the population is realize, and no offense to the clinicians in the room, you guys don't make us healthy. These other things make us healthy. And if we don't start paying attention to that, and we stop acting like I need to go to the doctor to become healthy, we need to start taking specific <coughs> personal responsibility for that. That's where I think digital health can play a really critical role. Because if I go to see Mike about my heart, which by the way, I have, he's wonderful. And if, if I have to see Mike about my heart, wouldn't it be great for Mike to be able to look in and see what the hell I've been up to versus me having to have to self-report that. Sure. I don't understand also why we don't do little things. Why don't we go out, so when I was trained, I went out to the waiting room to get my patients because I wanted to see that they have social support. What was their gait like? Uh, what was their affect when I walked out of the room? I had never had a doc come up to the waiting room to get me. Mm. It's little things like that that we don't pay attention to in medicine and in healthcare that I think are just absolutely myths. Wow. So I created a company called Strive Downtown Grand Rapids that Spectrum decided to close for I think all the wrong reasons. And it was focused on these very things of how do we actually address health and wellness instead of just treating illness and injury. And we would have the doctors come out and visit the people before they ever went back to the room. I think digital health is the insight to that. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about stethoscopes and we're talking about these other things, let's not forget we see a clinicians about 12 minutes a year in this United States, 12 minutes a year. That's a very, very small amount of time that somebody's determining if you're healthy or unhealthy. You're determining that outside of that office. And that's where I think it's all has to play in. Awesome. Any other ideas on how digital health can help Americans be healthier and happier? You know, everything that, that was mentioned, um, I think, Access is such a problem, you know, inequity of access is such a problem. And this might be something that levels the playing field in a meaningful way and gives people access to the same type of care. I 
think one of the big things in health care is why, as we've said, we're not incentivized to keep people healthy, but we never educated people about health. You know, I treat people on a, you know, event-based, you know, um, sequence, and that's, that's how we are paid. I don't have the opportunity to do this. I wouldn't mind it. I do have a public health degree, epidemiology and biostatistics, so I wouldn't mind doing more population health, but that is not the reimbursement model that we have. Right. I uh, read recently that Florida uh, passed legislation for uh, mandatory financial literature literacy in high schools. Right? Could you imagine our Florida education? Florida did that? Pardon me? Florida did that. Yeah, Florida did that. Could you, the San Francisco? <laughs> Could you imagine that there? happening in schools in, in Michigan, for instance, and having a positive effect on population health? I think that would be wonderful. But, but it's not necessarily financially, uh, financial planning driven and financial literacy, but it's health and wellness yeah. planning and literacy. Well, we're, we're investing in children, and one of the ways we do that is with education. I can't think of a better place to invest education in your own health. Right. You know? Um, I saw an interview with Warren Buffett, and he was speaking to a group of kids at, in Omaha, Nebraska. And they said, what advice would you give us? And he said, take care of yourselves. And he said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I'm willing to buy everyone in here a car of their choice. Whatever make and model, doesn't matter how expensive it is, I'm rich. But I'm having to sign a contract. And that is the only car you'll ever have in your life. How well will you take care of that car? Why wouldn't you do the same for yourself? And I think we have to start with children with those messages. Mm. So they have a top of mind as they make food choices, as they exercise. We need to start at a younger age. Because as we get to adults, we get set in our ways. And if we've done anything well in the United States, we've demonstrated that we know really well that abuse has consequences. We get to see them all. And um, I'm hopeful that that type of thing is studied so that it can be mirrored and modeled in other states. Um, if there are no uh, further uh, offerings, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, anything you can see you have three SMEs subject matter experts in health and digital health and What questions do you have about how Americans can be healthier and happier through digital health? I have a question so digital technology really has made great strides in 20 years So my Google search is really wasn't there 20 years ago and now it is really good at telling you what I should shop at is it that we take that, and why haven't we taken that same technology to be a more proactive health tool? And, and where is that going to come? Where do you predict the tools? So there's sensors, but I don't need just a sensor to get my data. I need it to help me do better. Where are we with that? So, you know, I work with Google. I don't know if that's driven me. I can tell you Google is actively pursuing um, it's interesting, their whole business, they have, anybody have an idea how many businesses Google has? Um, they have, I can't remember the exact number, it's all 300 businesses. They make money from one, right? That, and that's all they care, Those that funds everything else that they're doing. And one of the unique things I've learned about being out in Mountain View with them is that uh, we have an incredible opportunity, but what Google, I think, would say our difficulty is, and, is the adoption of that opportunity. Um, that it is extremely difficult to get people to adopt what is either not part of their current workflow, they haven't been trained to do, um, they feel as a threat to their current prestige or status or whatever it may be. And so it's really how do you balance that? Because I think there is a number of clinicians there and at Verily who would say, um, we can do a lot, but if you don't want to use what we've built, um, everyone's happy to look up where's the best restaurant in town, but how often is a clinician going to look up what's a better way to do this or that, um, and how am I going to rely upon 
their technology. So I think there's an issue there. I will say I've been working with Fitbit a little bit. Didn't mean to say it that way. And uh, they're also trying to get their prices down where you can essentially hand out the device like candy. Um, so that people who are in impoverished and unrepresented populations can have access to that information and they can use that information to deliver different programs and different resources into those communities based upon the unique data that they're finding. So I think there's a desire to even work around the existing system into those direct populations. But again, um, I'm not sure I have a perfect answer, but you should go out there with me next time you can ask. <laughs> you know, I, I was wondering if maybe you could just reframe that question because I'm, I'm Kind of hearing it a different way, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I, I just think it's fascinating what we've done with digital technology in 20 years. Yeah. And I think we're at the very beginning of that digital health. But it's the it's the iterative feedback. So you talked about the machine learning. I, I think that the technology that's under the surface is what lets us be successful with digital technology. Right. It's the stuff that happens behind the scenes. Google that makes it effective for me. I want to know where do we go with that technology that's behind the scene on my Fitbit or my Garmin or my Apple Watch. It gives me the real time feedback that helps me say, and it's starting. It's it's time to go to bed now. It's time to get up and move now. It's time to relax now, or you're stressed or you're tense. But but to be meaningful for population, because you're right. I see people once a year, or once every two years sometimes, and I get to give them a message that they hope to take. But if this could give it to me every four hours or every six hours, or if I had real-time feedback, and, and digital health is great at that beginning, digital search is way up there, but it's only been 20 years. It's fascinating what we've done in 20 years, and I hope we can do that with digital health. The right the, there's three barriers to transition to give you the information that you and I need, and I think Joe can help with this and there. He can potentially help us understand really what's happening on the software hardware side. But the first one is, it's lack of evidence because this is so new. So we have to figure out how we, we measure it. Digital health is gonna be helpful because it has an intervention property and it has a measurement property to it. So I think, number, like I said, number one is evidence. We need evidence of things that's really that have validated and worked. Then we can incorporate them efficiently. The second thing I have concerns about, which I think what speaks to your saying, is fragmentation. There's so many people who want to get involved, it's doing this. But what we need is cross-sectional collaboration among these experts to do something that's more uniform and aligning. And, and three, related to two, is you're seeing progress, but progress in silos. We, we've seen that in medicine for years. We need this in a meaningful way to realign it so those things have true value for the physicians and the patients because at the end of the day that is what we're trying to improve is that relationship we're trying to receive good information to give them good information that we interpret to make modifications in care as we see fit for better outcomes i hope that helps but i'm interested in, in joe's take on that is like that side of it's not mine not well mine. I, I think a lot of people got it thinking they could figure this out. Digital companies, technology companies, oh yeah, we'll do health care, it's gonna be great. And then they get in and they understand how complex it is and it's not worth their time. So I think it's been slower to adopt because this is such a complex thing. But um, to your point, it's getting better. Like the, the first week the Apple Watch came out, there were 12 of us at Spectrum who got one. And I've had it on my wrist since 2015, and it has grown significantly. I mean, the, the, the features have grown significantly. It, it is amazing, so iterative, yes. But there, to your point, the stuff that's underneath it, that's what's getting better. Uh, it just had a point out to the crowd. Uh, he did the second video visit ever at Spectrum, so <laughs> we were here from the we beginning. Got you, brother. <laughs> uh, the, the, the technology, the Artificial intelligence, which two years ago when you talk about it, it's just a fancy decision tree. Now it's really getting smart. We have enough data that we're now putting into machine learning to where you're going to start to see a, a real difference in how smart these devices are. The problem is you have to have one to reap the benefit of it. And these are not inexpensive. So to your point of Fitbit 
getting to a price point that you can just give them to people. That's where we need to be for this to be mass adopted. Yeah, I, I would add, I don't want to name a company just out of their privacy, but um, they're answering the so what question, right? You walk 10,000 steps, they go, so what? And I think that's where this is the next step that's gonna be really, really important. And they're doing it in a really cool, interesting way. Um, I've had a chance to test some of it. And I will say, while I'm maybe not liking some of what I'm hearing, it's really important data to hear. And uh, it does change your behavior because you do have that information coming back on a regular basis. Um, will it last and will it get better? I think it will, to your point, it's really becoming truly AI, not just machine learning or some algorithms. Um, and it's understanding my patterns and it's reminding me of what's going on in a really interesting way. So it's gone from, and it's, it is using this watch, but it's their software that's actually analyzing everything from my watch and telling me what that means, which a lot of it I'm not happy with. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll see if I believe it or not. You, you mentioned uh, behavior change, which is sort of the, the holy grail of human beings, right? We can, we can get the data, we can, someone can lead us to water, but they can't, they can't make us drink it. Are, there, uh, are you optimistic about digital health having a powerful effect on behavior change? I think more than ever, um, because we have to remain optimistic. Uh, I, I think mindset is such a, a critical aspect of health and, and health that you want to pursue for yourself. And, you know, as a clinician uh, in primary care, I mean, that is a daily mantra of my own. Say, so here's the things you have to consider to be healthy. However, I think my reach is limited and could be greater with this kind of a platform. You know, and I know that I resonate with certain people that I see, and I think that that type of person who that I appeal to them in the way that I communicate is greater, but it's a matter of finding them. Mm -hmm. I think this shortens the distance to find those other people out there that say, I like what he has to say. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're all familiar with the Tom's shoe model of half a decade ago and how that incentivized people to well, I had daughters, so they wanted to buy these shoes because they felt great about doing something good for somebody else far away. I was on a, a ski trip this past winter, and my friend's wife was telling me about an app that she is super excited about. She's really into fitness. She lives for the closed rings at the end of the day, and uh, she told me about this app. It starts with a V. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out exactly what it's called in a moment. But um, if you reach your fitness goal, some people, two meals are delivered to some hungry people. Isn't that amazing? And it motivated her and her friends to reach their fitness goals each day. Some really clever company got together with a bunch of brands. And if you go to the website, you'll see the brands that participate in that. So they're getting brand cachet by being the good guys and good gals that are donating the money for this free food. You don't pay for a thing with this app. You just use it and feel great about providing healthy meals to people that you'll never meet. And it's just that gamification and its ability to change behavior and incent positive behaviors is fascinating to me. I wonder if anybody in the room or anyone on the panel has uh, any, any uh, similar stories. Great program and great idea. I think you can get to that end much quicker and get that critical mass again with mass appeal. So, um, you know, one of the times she talked to her friends, but what if you could spread it through, you know, technology. So um, I hope there are more ideas like that. I've used an app before, it's called Charity Miles, where if you're out walking or running or biking, you get so many miles in and they'll donate to a charity that you pick. I was hoping you could donate the miles to me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. There was a Capital One commercial. Right. Right. Some guy was lifting weights and working out benefits. Uh, related to that, I'm going to donate my meals. <laughs> <laughs> Any other, just open-ended, any questions? I have a question. Um, 
question about the customizability of the digital. I, you're offering up these questions of motivation, and obviously what motivates the person who's donating meals um, might be different than what motivates the person that's saying, your heart isn't ticking very well, you better get up and get running, or whatever. So I'm wondering if there is that customizability that you're seeing in some of these digital opportunities that you could, like if you had a patient who you knew to be motivated by attaboys, there's there's an attaboy feature to it, or motivated by like, hey, you're dying because you're gaining weight, and somebody who may be sort of negatively motivated. Are you, are you seeing that customizability in the apps? That, um, I, I'm not aware of it at this point, but your point is a very good one because the ultimate stakeholder in all of this is the patient. And so when we talk about designing this and the people we expect to be in there, principle to that is going to be the patient who says, this is what I want from this. Yeah, so, so we, there, I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough to speak at South by Southwest a few weeks back. And when I was there, I was introduced to a group of people who, they're not public yet, they're still launching, but they've got some really amazing, it's called Bespoke Life. And it's about tailoring health and wellness solutions to your needs. And what you pay for is a certain type of membership. What you don't use, you can actually donate to somebody else. Um, and you can donate it as far as away, uh, far as away as uh, Africa. Um, so it's a really unique model because they are finding the different motivations you know, for different people. That's great. Yeah. It's my question, kind of tied in with hits. You know, we have different sensing devices that you're talking about for heart patients and potentially for knee replacement patients and things. What would prevent you from tapping into your, how many years now, six, seven years, Apple Watch, to collect those trends? You know, you've got your building automation that does all these things. It could pick that up as you go in through your doctorate visit. And it doesn't tell you anything real specific, but if it's somebody that you trust to partner with because they've got that clinical data you talked about, you could at least see overriding trends over a several year period. We've all got that data. We just haven't used it or haven't shared it with our doctors. There's a company we invested in uh, that actually does that. Okay. And um, they've recently sold. Um, but the guy who developed it, his name was Anil Sethi. He developed the first Apple Health Record. And then he created a, another company that actually is organizing all your health information. And uh, he's literally going back, believe it or not, uh, as far as your pediatric reviews, if, if it's available. It's almost like an ancestry.com, if you will, for health records. Um, and organizing that to a fashion and taking your current data and putting that in with it so you can point out those, those trends. Um, and it just got purchased, but I'm totally blank that we bought. Okay. Yeah. All the good of There are smaller groups that are uh, I have coworkers who live in New York. Uh, there is a company called Sherpa that is similar to direct primary care. Um, they give everybody a whoop strap, which is an activity tracker, but it, it's pretty in-depth, the data you can get from it. And the uh, provider will review all of their whoop data before you even leave. So this isn't, uh, I see you every six months or once a year. There are check-ins uh, at least once a month, but that data is then reviewed again. I think when you're small and you're not shackled by fee-for-service, you have opportunities to do things. Sure, and there's no special permission level other than signing up for the program. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So you had talked about the consumer adoption of some of these technologies, but a while ago you mentioned that one in five primary care physicians are retiring soon, or about two. Yes. I have a cousin who's in that boat. So my question is sort of your perspective on adoption by the provider community. Uh, how do you see digital health changing the nature of people entering the field of health with a digital mindset instead of a more traditional mindset. I think the presentation is going to be very important. I this is an sort of an inevitable good consequence of medicine. We're just driving in that way, and I think we did from the moment you know we turned on the lights of electronic medical record. Our lives have been forever changed. I did 12 years of paper charts, and now 13 years of electronic medical record. I'm hopeful that this new technology makes things less burdensome for physicians. I hope it adds a certain levity that the access of information is so much more efficient, that our practice days are, we're given good information to make good decisions. I, my mantra is the quality of information dictates the quality of care. The problem is I have trouble finding all the information, you know. 
Um, I believe that you know digi digital medicine is on its way to being just medicine. I think you're going to see very helpful tools that are going to be part of what we do, and we're going to try to wonder what was life before we didn't have it. But at the end of the day, my hope is, and my passionate plea is that we are creating things that are more physician and provider friendly so that we can still encourage young people to come into this profession that is noble and helpful. And uh, we've made it better because these technologies that people like Joe uh, and Roger are working with to make it better for the people ultimately delivering the care. So that's a great prophecy. We, we know we will have arrived when we stop, when we drop the word digital, just like when, remember when the graphic user interface was a new thing and we called them GUIs? And then they all became graphics, so we stopped. We just dropped the G. They're just UIs. It's really simple insight. Can I ask a question without picking a fight? Um, you, your group tried telehealth. Yeah. It didn't work. That's right. Primarily because the Time. physicians didn't buy didn't it. Didn't want to. There, there was nothing forcing them to use it. Now I do it every day. Global pandemic comes. Forced to do it, but now we're getting back to a new sense of normal. You think you're going to lose momentum, or is everybody bought in now that they've had two years under their belt? I really think that we we bought in. Um, I don't want to see it go away. I've actually found it to be very helpful for specific types of visits, and I'm in no way suggesting it will usurp face-to-face -face visits because that will forever be part of what we do and needs to be. But I believe that there are some visits that it will be very helpful for. What I'm hopeful for is people like yourself will help make audio and visual and other things better. So a guy doesn't drop his pants and show me cellulitis on his rear end. Um, I, I think I, I want to see a more interactive, um, I want to see a next level of digital health and telemedicine, but I hope it's for here to stay and I hope it continues to get better. Sorry about that cellulitis thing. Well, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. You know, come on. if you had just announced it before, I would have just told you, you like how you started yeah. it, it came on the screen, there we were, good to see you. That coffee? There was a lot of things. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's on his desk, and you know, I'm over it now. <laughs> so I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on you know, ensuring that there is equity as digital health just becomes health, and we're still trying to address health disparities in regular medicine. So who will take the lead on making sure that, you know, those gaps don't widen when we know that there are communities that might not be able to access, you know, all of the resources needed, like broadband internet and things like that. So what are institutions doing to ensure that that, that remains a focus? Can I take a stab at that? So I'm working with a bunch of companies right now focused on that, including Verizon, who has created a telehealth platform called Blue Jeans, and also who has created a phone, I'm going to forget the name of their phone, but they're handing out to communities who don't have access to broadband internet and or high you know, connectivity with cellular. Uh, and its goal is so they can cut out the inequities and the disparities of how they deliver healthcare. Because Verizon is now considering itself a healthcare company. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's, it, and by the way, good for them, right? Because everybody's got a Verizon app or phone or something, and a way to access that is pretty powerful. So, I think it's going to come from others uh, more quickly than it's going to come from our existing infrastructure. Because I hate to say it, US healthcare is still chasing the almighty dollar. And that dollar doesn't necessarily come from those populations. So, um, even when we say we see Medicaid patients, I see them on you know the third Tuesday when there's a full moon after the fourth sunrise uh, between three twelve and three thirteen, right? And we can say we see them. So I just I don't I don't think that I don't look at the incumbents as the solution to the healthcare crisis we have in America. I look at the incumbents as actually the cause of it. Uh, and so I think that we need to be willing to say who else is going to come in and change it. And I just, you know, as much as I love our hospitals and our clinicians, it's the infrastructure they have to work under and what has been set up that I think is not right. You know, to watch a physician or a nurse 
I look at a nurse making $60,000 a year and a CEO making $15 million. I'm like, something's not right with that seam right there. Uh, that just doesn't seem to be the way it should. So until those powers shift, and who's going to shift that? It's not going to be the people in charge. It's going to be others. So I think you're going to have to look to the Verizons, the Amazons, and others to want to do that. If you don't change reimbursement, you won't change behavior. No, so, <laughs> someone who's been practicing for 25 years, if you don't change reimbursement, you won't change behavior. Since 1995, there's not been one primary care residency that has filled on mass day, March 17th. 95. Long time. We have a young group that now is really work life balance is more important. And they're attracted to specialties that offer that emergency medicine, dermatology ophthalmology, radiology. You can't have inequity and say, and put the burden on primary care. Now, this will help because the people, there's so many who have transportation issues, I can jump right in. We were on a family vacation over spring break on a small little island 700 miles off the southeast tip of Miami. I saw a lady carrying stuff down this barely paved road and had a cell phone. That's all. And there you go. So I think computers are expensive, but people make the investment in cell phones so we can reach people in that way. Um, but you have to change reimbursement. There has to be some redistribution of things so that people incentivize to do primary care. Because really, what we have a shortage of is primary care, what you're speaking to, is the fact that we don't have enough. And so we have to bring that number up. And if we do, we can reach more people. It's very simple, simple math. More physicians who do primary care can see panels of people. The average primary care doctor carries a panel of about 22 to 2,500 in the United States. And again, in another statistic, and not, not doom and gloom, Joe, just trying to stick it back. So the article that, that spoke specifically about <laughs> The Great Resignation also stated we have an old aging population of physicians taking care of an aging population. So, from 2010 to 2020, 48% of licensed physicians are now over age 60. 16% are under 60. That's a problem. Okay? So, you can't take care of it if you don't have the population of people to do it. So, if you change reimbursement, you would change behavior. Last week there was an article, and I'm going to try to find it. I'll try to send it to you. Can put it out there, Brian. But it showed that when you add specialist to community versus primary care, the specialists had no improvement, discernible improvement in health outcomes. Primary care increases by 2.1 times. So primary care is sometimes the least glorified, but I think the area that if we're going to make a difference, that's the area we need to really invest. In. There was another question I saw some down here. Yeah. I mean, the basis of uh, providing language access solutions to healthcare organizations and, and technology has really been, uh, the advance in technology has really contributed to language access and having uh, been able to provide, uh, to bring an interpreter to your setting via telehealth in, in, in 200 languages in on demand. 24-7 has made a significant uh, contribution to, to language access, especially for rural areas and uh, for languages of limited diffusion. So I just wanted to to uh, allude to that because it, it has really made a, it's been a game changer for the organizations that have adopted that technology to to, to bring interpreters uh, on demand. Oh, I wish that was my idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always miss that. That was always a prerequisite for telehealth to have multi-party so that you could bring interpretive services on. Uh, and we learned very quickly that you can't use Google Translator for telehealth. No, that is obviously right. Uh, but there are multiple groups trying to solve for that. And can we have medical quality translation done without bringing a human being in through another screen or through the telephone or in person? And that's profoundly valuable. Can't uh, can't overstate that. Any last questions? What's the demographics of the people primarily using the uh, telehealth age-wise? Um, it has stayed consistent. I 
when I would work with Roger, we always said it's the alpha dog. Uh, 36 to 42, primarily female. Oh, generally like 80%. <laughs> it was the CMO of the household. She told her husband what to do. She took care of her kids. She was the sibling that all the other ones called to say, what do I do about this? And mom and dad would always call her and say, what am I supposed to do with Medicaid Part B? She, she would influence 25 people around her, and she was the one who found the access and convenience of telehealth to be most valuable. And she's also the one who would then post on social media to say, this is wonderful. So we always encourage that alpha daughter. You go through COVID and you tenfold growth in who's utilizing it, and it's still that same demographic. Is she getting her parents to use it? Because I'm wondering- She's telling everybody. The elderly population. And that, that. that's where that gap is in technology. When we talk about you can't, you know, there's certain ages that won't use this. That's not true. They're just going to call their daughter and say, I have a video for yeah, this two hours. That's awesome. Boy, you're right. <laughs> that's that's great. Great. We've really been sound with two years plus now doing it. You're right. That's who it is. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for this.